<laughs> All right, so we'll pick up um, where we left off last time. Um, actually, I moved back up just a little bit. So where we left off was talking about uh, these partial pressure gradients moving oxygen from the lungs into the blood. So for oxygen, that partial pressure gradient is really steep. And the venous blood that's coming in from those pulmonary arteries, so this is low oxygen blood, the partial pressure in that blood is only about 40. And the lungs, inside the lungs, it's like 100-ish. And so it's pushing that 60 milliliters of mercury that's pushing oxygen into the blood. Carbon dioxide, um, if you'll remember, the partial pressure gradient is not as steep because carbon dioxide is so much more soluble than oxygen. So in that low oxygen blood, that carbon dioxide um, has a partial pressure of about 45, but in the lungs it's only about 40, so that's just five millimeters of pressure pushing carbon dioxide out. But it's going to move in an equal amount with oxygen. Even though the pressures are different, the volume's the same because the solubility is different. So in order to stay efficient here, we have to match the amount of air that's coming into the lungs with the amount of blood that makes it to the lungs. Remember that the, the only reason that, that blood really goes there in those pulmonary vessels is to pick up oxygen. If there's no oxygen, there's no reason to waste our time. So we match ventilation, breathing, and perfusion, the amount of blood that's getting there for efficiency. Changes in the partial pressure of oxygen in your lungs changes the amount of blood flow that gets there. It changes the diameter of the arterioles. If you put more oxygen, if you have a higher partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs, well, the blood wants to go there to pick that oxygen up. So the, the arterial the arterial dilate. But here, we're, we're, we're increasing blood flow because that, that partial pressure of oxygen is really high. We get vasodilation. If we reduce the partial pressure of oxygen inside the lungs, the arterioles constrict. There's no reason to waste your time sending blood there because there's not any oxygen there. So the higher that partial pressure of oxygen, the more blood flow you get. We match ventilation with perfusion so that we can pick up the oxygen when it's there and we don't waste our time when it's not. Changes in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide change the diameter of the airway of the bronchioles. If you increase the amount of carbon dioxide inside your lungs, the bronchioles open. Now, remember our partial pressure gradients here. So in the atmosphere, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is negligible, like, like 0.2 or whatever, like we don't even care. In your lungs, it's like, you know, 40-ish. If you put more of that in your lungs, the airway opens up to let that carbon dioxide escape. It wants to escape anyway, so if you put more of that carbon dioxide in your lungs, the bronchioles die, like we open up the airway. And if you have less carbon dioxide in your lungs, they're going to constrict to conserve that carbon dioxide. And we'll talk about why you want to conserve it at all in just a bit. So, changes the diameter of oxygen, or sorry, changes in the partial pressure of oxygen, change the diameter of the bloodstream, of the, the arteriole, and changes in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, change the diameter of the airway of the bronchial. So here's our mismatch of ventilation and perfusion coupling. So here, um, you decrease ventilation, uh, breathing goes down. Um, for whatever reason, we're not getting as much oxygen in your lungs because oxygen regulates the diameter of the blood vessel. The blood vessels that are going to the arterial are the alveoli constrict, and you match that ventilation, or that perfusion with ventilation. Less oxygen, less blood. Here you have more oxygen, more oxygen, more blood. To get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, we have to cross the respiratory membrane. Right, so if you'll remember, the respiratory membrane, we have um, the alveoli here. So that's the wall of your type one cell. 
and then you have your, your capillary over here. And so that's all of your capillary endothelial cell. And to get those gases across to get oxygen and carbon dioxide out, you've got to cross through that respiratory membrane. It's like half a micrometer thick. If we end up with fluid in the lungs, water, whatever, there's fluid in the lungs, this creates a different issue because now you don't just have those cells to go through, we added fluid here too. And especially oxygen doesn't want to go through that fluid. Oxygen's not particularly soluble. And so uh, gas exchange becomes inefficient or inadequate because you can't push the, the air or the oxygen through that liquid. We'll talk about um, the respiratory membrane and its breakdown when we get to the pathophys next week. But we rely on this surface area of the lungs. So you have those alveoli. We talked about surface area last time. Lots of surface area here. So we have lots of oxygen moving through the respiratory membrane into the blood, carbon dioxide moving out. So now we're going to get the oxygen in the blood, get the carbon dioxide out. The opposite thing is happening at the cells. At the cells, at, as I've said, you already know where the stuff goes. You already know where oxygen goes. You already know where carbon dioxide goes. Oxygen is going to go into the tissues. Carbon dioxide is going to come out of the tissues. So once we, we load the blood with oxygen, it's going to circulate out to the tissues, and that oxygen is going to go into the tissues. So the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues is always lower than it is in that arterial blood. So that oxygen goes from the blood to the tissue. Partial pressure of oxygen in the venous blood is really low because you used it up. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the opposite thing. And there's this chart again. So here you see it in the tissue. So here's our blood that's, this is arterial blood with a partial pressure of oxygen about 100, carbon dioxide about 40. In the tissues, that partial pressure of oxygen is less than 40. So now the oxygen goes to the tissues. You already know this. You know that's why you're breathing, period. It's to move that oxygen into the tissues. And then you want to move that carbon dioxide out. So the carbon dioxide pressure here is higher than 45. It's only about 40 in that blood. So it's going to go out into the blood. The reason oxygen and carbon dioxide move is because they always move with that pressure gradient. They're always moving from high to low pressure. So when oxygen or carbon dioxide move anywhere, whether we're talking about from the lungs to the blood or the blood to the tissues, it's because of that pressure gradient. And it's always moving from high to low pressure. So now we need to talk about how it gets from one place to the other. Transport. Obviously these gases are transported in the blood and they're transported in different ways. Oxygen is carried by hemoglobin. Nearly all of it. Yes, some of it just straight up dissolves in the plasma, but most of it is bound to hemoglobin in the red blood cell. As we talked about red blood cells, remember red blood cells are basically just stacks of hemoglobin and every molecule of hemoglobin will hold four molecules of oxygen. We say that hemoglobin is saturated when all four groups are bound to oxygen. That's oxyhemoglobin. Incidentally, hemoglobin, hemoglobin, so that I don't ever have to write that again. There's hemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is hemoglobin with the oxygen. Reduced hemoglobin is hemoglobin without the oxygen. So here you see that reduced hemoglobin grabbing the oxygen. Now we have oxyhemoglobin and hydrogen proton we're not going to be concerned with at the moment. <clears throat> this is a reversible reaction. Oxygen binding to hemoglobin is fully reversible. It has to be. Because we have to unload that oxygen. We, do, we don't just have to grab it. We have to let it go as well. Remember our rules for proteins here. When proteins bind the things, they change shape. Whether we're talking about a receptor, uh, like for acetylcholine or a, a ligand-gated channel, whatever, when proteins bind to stuff, they change shape. And hemoglobin is no different. When hemoglobin binds to oxygen, it changes shape. Remember that each hemoglobin will hold four oxygens. So when that first oxygen sticks to hemoglobin, it changes shape. And it makes it easier for the next one to stick. 
change the shape a little again, it makes it easier for the third one, and then the fourth one to stick. As oxygen binds, the affinity increases. It's easier to get oxygen to stick to hemoglobin after that first oxygen binds. And at the tissues, when hemoglobin lets go of oxygen, it's easier to get rid of the others. The affinity decreases. Like I said before, we consider hemoglobin fully saturated if all four heme groups are bound, 100% saturated. And partially saturated if it's between one and three. When hemoglobin is bound to oxygen, it's bright red. When it's reduced, it's less red, like it's darker. You've seen this, like you've seen venous blood, if they've ever drawn blood from you, that venous blood is really dark. Arterial blood where that heme is saturated, like it's bright red. How oxygen loads and unloads is regulated by a few things. The first is the partial pressure of oxygen. These other things we'll get to in just a second, temperature and pH, this sort of thing. First, let's talk about oxygen. What you would expect here with the, how the partial pressure of oxygen influences how much oxygen is in the blood, what you would expect is if we take uh, our partial pressure of oxygen here and our percent saturation here, what you'd expect is that. That as I increase the amount of oxygen, if we increase the partial pressure of oxygen, you get more oxygen binding to hemoglobin. That's actually not quite the case. It's not a line at all. It's kind of an S shape. It's a curve. Like this. This is our oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. And I've reversed my axes here. So there's your percent, there's your partial pressure of oxygen. It doesn't really matter. The idea is the same. So here's the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs at about 100. Here's your percent saturation of a hemoglobin, about 100. All right, so what if we back the partial pressure of oxygen off to like 80? It's at about 99. You back it off to like, like 60. Even at 60 millimeters of mercury in the lungs, hemoglobin's like 94% saturated. You back it off to like 40 millimeters of oxygen. Well, now the hemoglobin's less saturated. Incidentally, that 40 millimeters of mercury there that we see that's the partial pressure in resting tissues. So notice that curve is kind of slipping off here. That's because hemoglobin is letting go of oxygen at those tissues. And the more active tissues are, the lower that partial pressure of oxygen is going to be. So hemoglobin is less bound to, to oxygen. In active tissues, hemoglobin is letting go of the oxygen. And that's what we see here. As that curve sort of slips off there, that's hemoglobin letting go of oxygen. And up here, this is hemoglobin being loaded into there, and, and like it's it's there. Now, the thing here is that your normal percent saturation of hemoglobin, like right now, if we put a pulse oximeter on you, your blood is like 98, 99% saturated just normal conditions. We could, I could tell you to breathe deeper and slower. You're already 99% saturated. What else do you want? You're going for 100, does it matter? No. Like if I put you, like if I go buy that $40 can of canned oxygen at CVS, which is stupid, but if I go buy that, like why is it 40 bucks? So you go buy that, right now, the percentage of saturation of your blood is like 99. What are you getting out of that? Nothing. 
increasing the partial pressure of oxygen, whether I'm whether breathing more deeply or I'm forcing oxygen into you, for normal everyday basis, there's no benefit to that. When we use oxygen for patients, it's because that percent saturation is too low. And we have a risk of, of, of that saturation going down, so we're pushing more oxygen in. But for everybody else, they, there's not a lot of benefit to this, if any at all. In the venous blood, with a partial pressure of oxygen in that venous blood is only about 40 millimeters of mercury, hemoglobin is still 75% saturated. That means even in the low oxygen blood, you still have 75% saturation, right? In oxygenated blood, the percent there is about 20% of its oxygen. In deoxygenated blood, it's still 15%. That means that every time those blood cells make a circulation, if every molecule of hemoglobin is carrying four oxygens, they let go of one. They got backup. We've got more. So what's the thing for you? You can hold your breath. What happens if you hold your breath? You've got oxygen to spare. You're good. More on that in just a bit with the idea of holding your breath and what happens there, but. There's more than enough oxygen in your blood. There's so much oxygen in your blood that if, um, if, if we have active tissues, like right now as, as you're writing stuff down, both the, the muscles in your hand are burning more oxygen. They need to be compensated for that. Luckily, there's more than enough oxygen in your blood to do that. So what happens? You drop off more oxygen. Your heart doesn't have to beat faster. Your blood pressure doesn't have to go up. And you don't have to breathe harder because you're riding so hard. You just let more oxygen go because there's more than enough oxygen in the blood to compensate that. So we increase the partial pressure of oxygen. Anything above 70, you're only going to get mild benefits there. Um, this also ensures that oxygen loading and delivery is adequate even at lower levels. So you go above sea level, you go to Denver, the partial pressure is lower, but you're still going to get enough oxygen in your blood. Only about 20 or 25% of that oxygen is dropped off in one circulation. And like I said, if oxygen levels in the tissues drop, Hemoglobin just lets go of more oxygen. How does it know to let go of more oxygen? This is not like a thinking, it's not like a, co a computation that hemoglobin's making. It's like, I think you're doing something with that muscle right now. Here's some more oxygen. It's a reaction, right? There are chemical signals that cause this to happen. The conditions that are created by active tissues cause hemoglobin to let go of oxygen. Well, what are conditions then for active tissue? Active tissues are taking glucose and that oxygen, and they're producing ATP and water and carbon dioxide. So the more active a tissue is, the more carbon dioxide it's producing. The increase in that carbon dioxide causes hemoglobin to let go of oxygen. Not only that, that increase in carbon dioxide from a reaction we'll talk about in just a second, causes an increase in hydrogen protons. That's a, a decrease in pH. Active tissues have a lower pH that makes hemoglobin let go of oxygen. We're not gonna worry about biphosphoglycerate. Um, Active tissues, the situation that happens. So, like if you think about muscle, muscles produce a lot of heat. That's an increase in temperature. The increase in temperature makes hemoglobin let go of oxygen. So, the more active a tissue is, the more hemoglobin drops off that oxygen because active tissues need that oxygen to drive that reaction. Active tissues get more oxygen because that 
situation that's created, this environment that's created by an active tissue makes hemoglobin let go. If we were to graph this, we would say that we're shifting the curve to the right. And it looks like uh, this, so we're shifting that curve. So here's like normal body temperature. If you're exercising or whatever, your body temperature goes up, that curve shifts over this way. And that means that hemoglobin is letting go of oxygen. And you can see like our, our percent saturation, hemoglobin is letting go of oxygen at a, at a faster rate here. If, you're, if you are colder, that rate slows down. Here's carbon dioxide. Here's your normal arterial carbon dioxide level. 40, 45 millimeters of mercury. Um, you'll notice that that partial pressure of carbon dioxide and that hydrogen proton thing are tied together. We'll talk about that in just a second because carbon dioxide affects acid-base balance. More on that later. But So there's your normal pH here. Here's what happens when we shift over like an exercising tissue. That curve shifts to the right and hemoglobin lets go of oxygen. All right, active tissues make hemoglobin let go of oxygen. Hypoxia is when you have inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. Lots of things cause hypoxia. You don't have enough blood. You don't have enough hemoglobin, or hemoglobin's weird. Blocking circulation to a tissue, that causes hypoxia. Poisons like cyanide cause hypoxia. Pulmonary diseases, or carbon monoxide. Okay, carbon monoxide. If you're unfamiliar with carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide it's a product of combustion. When stuff burns, you produce carbon monoxide. Whether we're talking about like what, if it's burning, car exhaust, natural gas, whether we're producing carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide will also bind to hemoglobin. We don't need carbon monoxide. Hemoglobin doesn't disassociate with carbon monoxide. So if carbon monoxide binds there, you don't have any reason to let it go. And if it's bound to hemoglobin, oxygen can't bind to hemoglobin. Hypoxia. The thing with carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide poisoning is quite often um, when, when people die of carbon monoxide poisoning, um, they never had a clue. Right, they go to bed and they just don't wake up because something malfunctioned, like the, the heater's exhausting into the house, something carbon monoxide so for some reason is exhausting into the house from the furnace, and you can't smell it, you can't see it, you have no idea it's there, and you just don't wake up. Um, when you see carbon monoxide poisoning in acute form, because that carbon monoxide has displaced the oxygen, they're going to be struggling to breathe they be breathing really fast, trying to get some oxygen into their blood. The trick here is that that carbon monoxide, when it binds the hemoglobin, hemoglobin turns bright red. So if you have a patient that comes in and they're bright red and they're breathing really fast, the first thing that you suspect is that they're hyperventilating. How do you treat someone who's hyperventilating? them back and they regurgitate the CO2 that they're exhaling and this will bring pH levels back to normal. We'll look at that later but if they have carbon monoxide poisoning you'll kill them because they already are not getting enough oxygen in their blood because that carbon monoxide has take, taken its place and now you're having them breathe back in carbon dioxide and not oxygen and they look very similar so like, you don't just jump to that hyperventilation thing um, with the carbon monoxide. I, I, like chronic carbon monoxide poisoning is a different thing. Like chronic carbon monoxide poisoning, it does build up over time, but in smaller doses, like over time, it causes weird symptoms, hallucinations. Um, people see things. 
there's always an article that gets reprinted this time of year in one of the medical journals about uh, this where people thought their house was haunted because they had a uh, carbon monoxide poisoning and they had no idea, like it was just low levels of it. And they're like, the walls are bleeding. And the doctor, like they finally, somebody's like, you need to see a doctor. They're like, yeah, you have carbon monoxide poisoning. Like, oh, well, we do have like gas lights in the house. That's like the 1900s. They're like, yeah, you should get an electricity guy. <laughs> All right, so carbon monoxide gets transported in the blood differently. Not carbon monoxide, we don't want this ever. If you ever breathe in stuff that's been burning, it's carbon monoxide, car exhaust, cigarette smoke, carbon monoxide, avoid that. Carbon dioxide, okay, we make that. So carbon dioxide gets transported in the blood, somewhat dissolved in plasma, right? It's really soluble, so it will dissolve in the plasma. A lot more than we saw with oxygen, like with oxygen, it's like 1% dissolved in the plasma. Here it's like 10% dissolved in the plasma. Some of that carbon dioxide will actually bind to hemoglobin as carbamino hemoglobin. But the vast majority of carbon dioxide gets transported as bicarbonate in the plasma, HCO3 negative. And the reason for that is that it's a chemical reaction. So this carbon dioxide is going to enter the red blood cell. And when it does, right, there's water there. Carbon dioxide reacts with that water. And when it does, so let's add that carbon dioxide in the water, we get H2CO3. That's carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid is quickly going to fall apart into a hydrogen proton and bicarbonate. And this is a reversible reaction goes both ways. Oh, well, there it is on the slide. And that's one of the linear forms. This happens inside the red blood cell. It happens very quickly because we have an enzyme in the red blood cell called carbonic anhydrase. And carbonic anhydrase puts them together here instantly. And then that falls apart. If we're talking about the systemic capillaries, so systemic capillaries, we're out there in the tissues, carbon dioxide levels are high, carbon dioxide is moving into the blood, and it's going to enter the blood cell, it's gonna undergo this reaction, we're gonna get bicarbonate, and that bicarbonate is immediately gonna shift out of the red blood cell and into the plasma. It's a negative ion, so it immediately has to be replaced, and it gets replaced with a chloride ion, called a chloride shift, here's a picture. So here's the bulk of our carbon dioxide. It's coming in, it's binding, the, it's combining with that water, because of this carbonic anhydrase, carbonic acid, there's our bicarbonate. Here's our chloride shift, bicarbonate out, chloride in, and now that bicarbonate is out here in the plasma. That's how carbon dioxide gets carried. Notice that as that happens, right, some of this carbon dioxide is binding to hemoglobin. When that happens, it's happening because oxygen has vacated that hemoglobin. And that carbon dioxide is kind of taking its place. So, um, So we get back about 20% of that carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin, which is conveniently about how much oxygen got dropped off. So it's just going to take its place. How much carbon dioxide can bind to hemoglobin? How much oxygen left? They're taking up the same sort of real estate. In the pulmonary capillaries, at the lung, the opposite's going to happen. That bicarbonate is going to move from 
the plasma back into the red blood cell. It's going to combine with that hydrogen proton, make carbonic acid. That enzyme is going to split it in half. Carbon dioxide is going to leave. We get the opposite reaction. So here's that happening. Why does that happen? Well, because oxygen is coming back in. And so we get that shift back out of carbon dioxide. So most of this carbon dioxide is being carried in the blood as bicarbonate. How much carbon dioxide you can carry is directly affected by how much oxygen is there. The more oxygen that's there, the less carbon dioxide you can carry. And the lower oxygen is, the more carbon dioxide you can carry. They're taking up the same room. And they kind of swap places. At the tissues, as that carbon dioxide enters the blood, oxygen leaves hemoglobin. We talked about this earlier. There's more carbon dioxide in those active tissues, and it makes oxygen leave hemoglobin. And then that hemoglobin binds to the carbon dioxide. That bicarbonate is important because it creates a buffer in the blood. Your blood is a really good buffer, and we'll talk about pH balances in blood later. But your blood is a good buffer. And the reason that it is, is because of that bicarbonate ion. Whenever you see this hydrogen proton, that's always, that's sort of your definition of an acid. And if that hydrogen proton concentration goes up, then it just binds to that bicarbonate and it kind of neutralizes it. And if that hydrogen concentration starts to go down, more of that carbonic acid falls apart and lets go of that hydrogen proton. We'll talk about this pH balance thing later. So don't worry about it right now. We'll come back to pH balances and what's happening there and how the respiratory system and this carbonic acid and bicarbonate thing affects that. So don't worry about respiratory rates and pH at the moment. Okay. <coughs> Controlling respiration is driven at the brainstem. So we have a skeletal muscle here. It is a voluntary muscle. But you don't have to think about breathing. Why? Well, because the act of breathing, the sort of autopilot that breathing is, is doing, is controlled in the brainstem. That traps not voluntary. You've got these uh, parts of the reticular formation in the medulla and the pons, this reciprocal network of both um, sensory and motor neurons. In the, the medulla, we've got the dor dorsal respiratory group. It, it's right, like creating on their nine-ish. This is a sensory thing. It's in integrating input from stretch receptors of the lung and chemoreceptors that are detecting pH of blood. The ventral respiratory group is what actually generates normal rhythm. Normal breathing rhythm is called eupnea. 12, maybe 15 breaths a minute. And this generates normal breathing rhythm. We have two sets of neurons. One that's excitatory. This comes through a big nerve called the phrenic nerve that goes to the diaphragm. When it fires, the diaphragm contracts. Then we have another group of neurons that fires, expiratory neurons that fire, and they stop the inspiratory neurons. Diaphragm relaxes. So we have this network of, of excitation, inhibition, excitation, inhibition, and we get our normal breathing rhythm. Now, to smooth that out, that transition between inhaling and exhaling, we have another group up here in the pond called the pontine respiratory center. And this interacts with those places of the medulla to smooth out the pattern. So that inhaling and exhaling is fluid. It's not inhale and then exhale. Like there, it's all one big event. Where did it start? Like how does it, how does this like generate? Uh, we don't like understand that a lot, but those two sets of neurons um, sort of self-amplify each other, so they're reciprocal. 
one fires, it makes the other one fire, which stops the other one, and it's just a network. It's this vicious cycle that never stops. How deep you breathe and how fast you breathe is controlled by these respiratory centers. How deep you breathe is um, determined by how much of it fires. Like, the deeper you breathe, the more that diaphragm is contracting, we're using more motor units, how many of those neurons are firing. How fast you breathe is determined by how long that fires. And both of those things are modified based on the demands of the tissue. The biggest factor that determines the rate and the depth of your breathing is carbon dioxide. It's not oxygen. As we said before, we've got oxygen to spare. Right? Even in the low oxygen blood, hemoglobin is 75% saturated. Oxygen is not our driving factor here. Carbon dioxide is. If carbon dioxide levels start to go up, carbon dioxide, when, we, when you see carbon dioxide, it's not an acid. Chemistry, it's not an acid. But we can call it that. We can, in essence, that's what we get. Carbon dioxide creates the acidic environment. That's a decrease in pH. Because it forms carbonic acid, which is an acid. When that carbonic acid forms and dissociates and releases that hydrogen proton, that stimulates those chemoreceptors in the respiratory center of the brain, and it triggers breathing. You can hold your breath. When you hold your breath, you don't breathe again because you ran out of oxygen. You've got oxygen to spare. You breathe again because carbon dioxide built up. And as carbon dioxide builds up, it forces you to breathe. Last time we talked a little bit about scuba diving. Uh, have you ever seen free divers? Free divers are like scuba divers minus the scuba. So um, the, the event here is to dive as deep as you can without drowning. And so um, these people will hold their breath for like 15 minutes. So how the hell do they pull that off? And you're like, I can't hold my breath for 30 seconds. The trick to this is to stop the accumulation of carbon dioxide. Now they're, they're swimming underwater, so the muscles are generating that carbon dioxide. So you're not gonna stop that generation of carbon dioxide. You've got to lower the levels in your blood somehow. So what they do is, and you'll see this, like as they get ready to go in the water, they intentionally hyperventilate. When you hyperventilate, you exceed the need of the body to get rid of carbon dioxide. Hyperventilating, you're blowing off too much CO2. And so they do this on purpose, and if you've ever seen anybody hyperventilate, if it keeps going, they'll eventually pass out. We'll look at that in just a second. So like these people, like they get to that point where they're just about to pass out, and they dive in the water. Let's not die. And so then as they're swimming, that carbon dioxide starts to accumulate in their blood, and then they have to know what, at what point they need to come up before this happens. Because if this happens, at some point, that carbon dioxide is building up, and you're underwater, and your brain's like, no, we're going to breathe. Like your kids ever like, I'm going to hold my breath until I die. No, you're not. You're going to breathe. You can't even, like, yeah, you're not going to hold your breath that long. It's not going to happen. Because those chemoreceptors stimulate that part of the brainstem. This is actually how, how breathing works when you're born. So when you're born and they cut that cord, there's no more gas exchange at the placenta now. You need to breathe. How, how did your lungs know that it's time to breathe? How does that diaphragm contract? Well, those chemoreceptors cause that inspiratory neuron to fire, and you have to breathe now because of that buildup of carbon dioxide. So like I said, hyperventilation exceeds the need to get rid of that carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide levels in your blood drop. It's called hypocapnia. What, if you've ever seen anybody hyperventilate, what will happen is they'll pass out. The reason they pass out is it, it constricts blood vessels to the brain as the pH goes up and they pass out. And then the brain's like, all right, now that you're asleep, you can manage this crap. Um, if someone hyperventilates and pass out, they'll stop breathing for a second. 
N, when you stop breathing, we have apnea. Apnea means that you're not breathing. Whether we're talking about sleep apnea or just like at this point, like apnea. Breathing stops and carbon dioxide builds up in your blood again. Problem solved. Patients with sleep apnea, you've never seen this, so patients with sleep apnea stop breathing in their sleep because the airway gets blocked. Carbon dioxide builds up in their blood, yeah. respiratory center in the brain fires, and they, they forcefully move air, and that's the snoring that you have, um, as they force air past that soft palate that's collapsed, but the, that respiratory center fires. And it also tends to wake them up, and we talked about that last semester. The partial pressure of oxygen is not as important. There are chemoreceptors in the aorta and in the carotid arteries that are oxygen sensors. Um, if there's a reduced partial pressure of oxygen, they will cause those respiratory centers to fire faster. But it takes a substantial drop before that becomes an issue. Like the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood has to be less than 60 millimeters of mercury before oxygen becomes the driving factor. We go back and we look at our disassociation here. 60 millimeters of mercury there. That would put, so um, 60 millimeters of mercury, there's your percent saturation. At 60 millimeters of mercury, like your pulse ox would be down to like 90 something. Then oxygen becomes an issue. But the thing is, is that, uh, right, even at reduced atmospheric pressure, we're still getting that oxygen to, to come in. But it takes a substantial drop to make it the respiratory stimulus. And we're gonna have to severely reduce the amount of oxygen, or the partial pressure of oxygen before it's the driving factor, before you're breathing harder to get more oxygen in. What would be that? Pulmonary diseases. And, and it's a it's a, a twofold thing. Altitude. As altitude increases, the partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of the atmosphere, because the whole atmospheric pressure decreases. So the partial pressure of oxygen decreases. As the partial pressure of oxygen decreases, it's harder to get that oxygen to go in your blood. You have to to, uh, to try to get more oxygen there in some way. So um, at some point it becomes breathing faster. Okay, carbon dioxide, major driving factor. Um, the pH will also change breathing rate even if the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels are normal. This is called compensation and we will talk about this later when we get the pH balance. So, carbon dioxide, the most powerful respiratory stimulant. Partial pressure of oxygen only affects breathing sort of indirectly, normally. If the arterial partial pressure drops below 60 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, now it becomes a stimulus for respiration. Okay, pH up later. In addition to all of this, you can override it from the higher brain centers you can voluntarily hold your breath. So in the cerebral cortex, you can voluntarily hyperventilate. Now, at some point, your brain decides that you're an idiot, and it's like, yeah, you should probably breathe, stupid. So you can't, like, hold your breath and die. Your brain's gonna take over that. Now, you might be able to force yourself to hyperventilate until you pass out, but then when you pass out, your brain takes over again. So um, even those voluntary cortical things um, if, even if you temporarily bypass them, the controls from the brain stem will eventually take over. Um, limbic system has some of this, like you get mad, you breathe harder, pain, you breathe harder. Um, and in an increase in body temperature causes you to breathe harder because the oxygen's letting go of hemoglobin. Irritants in the airway will change the way you breathe because irritants in the airway cause constriction of the airway. This can be like an allergic response and the airway constricts. We're not even worried about coughing and sneezing. There is a reflex in the lungs, this hearing through a reflex, 
um, they're stretchy centers. You can't over inflate the lungs. So you're like, I'm gonna inhale till my lungs pop. You can't do it. There's an inspiratory maximum, right? There's a total lung capacity that's gonna max it out. And what happens that is, if you try this and you're just gonna keep sucking in air, a signal from the lungs, a reflexive signal from the lungs goes back and causes inhalation to stop. This is more of a protective reflex. This isn't like generating the rhythm of breathing. This just prevents you from overinflating the lungs. As you do stuff like exercise, you have to adjust for this. Breathing faster is hypertonia. How fast are you going to breathe? It depends on what you're doing. The breathing rate is going to be directly correlated with the metabolic needs that you've got going on. So you just dead sprint down the hall, place that sudden need um, for oxygen. From, uh, the tissues, you immediately compensate it for it by breathing faster. During exercise, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the partial pressure of oxygen, and the pH stay pretty freaking constant because you're breathing faster. Oxygen levels don't go down when you exercise because you're breathing faster. Carbon dioxide levels don't come up when you exercise because you're breathing faster and you're getting rid of it faster. And that keeps that pH balanced as well. So all of that stays pretty constant. And that increase in ventilation that happens with exercise are it's there to compensate for all these different factors. There's three neural factors that cause this increase in ventilation. For some people, they're super excited about exercise. They're breathing faster before they even start doing crap. They're messed up. Like, they're like, I'm so excited about exercise, but I got this guy. All right, can I just have the heart attack? Can we just try that? Because I'm not running. Then as you do stuff and you're, and you're exercising, you get this cortical activation of those respiratory centers breathing faster and those excitatory respiratory, those excitatory impulses are coming to the respiratory centers from those chemoreceptors as carbon dioxide is being created and triggering that increased breathing rate. When exercise stops, ventilation slows down in a hurry because that demand is gone and those neural factors shut off. If you go from here to a really high altitude, really fast, you might suffer from something called acute mountain sickness. All right, so I'm not talking like here to Denver. While here to Denver is not like great, it kind of sucks, uh, especially if you're gonna go do stuff, because the partial pressure there is lower. So if you put a demand on yourself before you adjust, it's rough. I'm talking like here to like the base of Mount Everest. Okay. So if you've ever seen these, these uh, adventurers that are gonna like, I'm gonna go climb Mount Everest. They get there and they're at base camp, like at the base of the mountain. And there's all these freaking people at base camp. And they stay there for a while. But like before they ever start trying to climb the mountain. There's another camp that's further up the mountain, and they're going to stop there for a while. You can helicopter into the camp that's further up the mountain. But if you're coming from, like, here to there, you can't stay long. And I've seen several things like this where the crew goes up there, and they're like, we have this amount of time before we've got to get down. And the reason for that is acute mountain sickness. Because when you go to that higher altitude above 8,000 feet, um, you're going to see headaches, shortness of breath, nausea, dizziness, and if you stick around, it might kill you. Because that partial pressure of oxygen is so low, the blood vessels are going to start to um, constrict in places, and then the brain's not getting enough oxygen, so the blood vessels dilate, and then fluid starts to move out around the brain. It's a mess. So you have to, you have to adjust to this altitude. This is becoming um, acclimated. Uh, acclimatization is these adjustments to the higher altitude. There are frequent people that live in Nepal. 
right there, right there at the bottom of Mount Everest, and they live there. Like the guides that take people up the mountain, they're like, yeah, it's a mountain in the sky. Um, now, once you get to a certain altitude, no. Like at, at a certain altitude, you're in space, basically, and like you, you'll see those idiots that are climbing, they got their freaking scuba gear on because there's no way to breathe. But like in that second base camp, there's like the, the people that live there, they just like walk around there, cool. Um, if you ever watch Mount Everest, uh, I think people climb this. As you go up the mountain, there's all, I don't even remember, there's a number of people that are dead on that mountain. We're not getting them back. It's, it's too dangerous to try to drag their corpse down the mountain. Um, they made it that far. And, and so you're already, if you're thinking about this, like you're already climbing this mountain, the partial pressure of oxygen is really low. You're having to wear this gear. There's no way we're gonna get like a team up there to, to carry you back down because the risk is too high for them. And then we get more bodies on the mountain. So yeah, they, you just if you end up dying there, they're gonna leave you. So you know, don't try. I mean, people are dying. This is the mountain telling you, you know what? You just stop it. But there are people that live like at the lower altitudes there, and they've adjusted to this. Well, what happens when you stay at these higher altitudes is those chemoreceptors become more responsive to the car partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is your respiratory stimulant. So what happens? You start breathing faster. Um, that minute ventilation rate increases and it will stabilize at that faster rate and you're moving several liters of oxygen more than you did at sea level. Okay, if you give it long enough, the kidneys also are hypoxic, and the kidneys start to make a resorphoietin. Resorphoietin means you make more red blood cells. More red blood cells, more oxygen that you can carry. So you can compensate for the lack of oxygen by putting more of, like you can make more of it stay in your bloodstream, right? You can carry more of it now. There's not as much in the air, so let's load it up in the blood and just hold it there. Over time, you'll get new blood vessels. We talked about angiogenesis when we talked about um, uh, anastomoses in, in places. Uh, if tissues become hypoxic long enough, eventually new blood vessels sprout off to compensate for that lack of oxygen. So if we look at like from here to like Denver, it, it, it takes a few weeks to really become acclimated. Um, if you ever go do anything in Denver, like you, and it's not so much anymore, but um, they used to complain, like, uh, like sports teams that would go play in Denver used to complain because going to the higher altitude, um, they always complained that it was a performance advantage for the home team. It's a natural advantage. I mean, it's there. I mean, what are you going to do about it? It's where they live. Um, not so much anymore. Um, they still complain about it. <laughs> you got to complain about something if you lose. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's it's there. There's nothing that there's nothing that, like I can force them to move to a lower altitude to play football or whatever. Um, but yeah, so you adjust to it, um, and it does take a while. All right, so we're going to touch on pathophysiology. Next week we're going to come back and we're going to look at pathophysiology in a lot more detail. So right now we're just going to introduce some of the terms. The first is COPD. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, most of the time when we say COPD, we're talking about either chronic bronchitis or emphysema. <coughs> obstructive disease, obstructive, we're blocking this, right? When we think of obstructive disease, obstructive disease is increasing resistance. Resistance is the opposition to flow. We're making it more difficult for air to move. Okay, chronic bronchitis is the easy one here to understand. So in chronic bronchitis, the, the bronchioles are inflamed. And so that tube goes from like this fun little muscular tube, and then when you get inflammation, it, it's like that, right? So you increase resistance. It's much harder to get air through this tiny little tube. That difficulty is Amplified 
when you exhale. Because when you exhale and the lungs are getting smaller, it's pushing on this tube anyway. And if the tube's inflamed and tiny, you block it off completely. So while it's difficult to inhale, it's much harder to exhale. And what you get is this decrease in your ability to get air out of the lungs. Air gets trapped in the lungs. Okay, what's in that arrow? Carbon dioxide. Lots of carbon dioxide. Your major respiratory stimulus. Carbon dioxide starts to build up. It's building up in the blood, it's building up in the lungs. It's making you breathe. So what happens to these patients is they can't finish inhaling because they already got to exhale. So they don't get all the oxygen they need in and they can't get all the carbon dioxide they need out. And what you get is uh, dyspnea, which is this, they're working really freaking hard to breathe. It's a lot of work. One, because they're squeezing air through those tiny little tubes. And, and two, because they can't finish inhaling before they exhale. They can't take a deep breath. Taking a deep breath for them is like you holding your breath for a minute. <clears throat> like they already have too much carbon dioxide building up, so they gotta exhale. It's triggering that exhalation. So they gotta struggle to breathe. We'll look at what lungs look like later. Um, emphysema is not like a, just a, a inflammation of the tube. In emphysema, um, you break down the alveolar walls, so you lose that surface area, and we can't get those gases to move in and out. Um, we'll talk about what happens here. We'll look at some lungs. Uh, if you've never seen a patient with emphysema, while they're alive, a patient with emphysema, the struggle's real. Like it's, they work so hard to breathe. And uh, these are like, in sort of the lighter stages of this, these are patients that are on oxygen all the time. As it gets worse, these are patients that they, they can't do anything because any activity immediately causes this demand to take place and there's no way they can get enough oxygen in to meet the demands of any tissues. So they're more or less bedridden because they can't tolerate activity. Like their activity is going to the bed to the chair. So, um, and eventually you get respiratory failure and, and acidosis. Um, the most common feature of patients with uh, COPD is smoking. 80% like of your COPD patients smoke. Again, more on this when we get to Pendleton. So, later. Um, asthma. Uh, asthma is also obstructive, but asthma is just when that airway becomes inflamed and it constricts and spasms. Why? Well, there's multiple reasons for this to happen. A lot of it is uh, an autoimmune thing. We're releasing immunoglobin E and histamine and we get inflammation and constriction of those bronchi. Um, we have eosinophilic asthma. There are lots of causes for asthma. Um, people that have activity um, triggered asthma, like or exercise triggered asthma, where they get up and exercise and causes the asthma. So people that have allergic asthma or eosinophilic asthma, there's multiple causes here. And when we treat asthma, we treat this by using a, a, a corticosteroid to reduce inflammation over time. This is like your long-term thing. Or if it's short, like we need to treat it like right now because you have this acute asthma attack, we use a bronchodilator. That's your albuterol. That's that little, the little one. Um, and so you use that, that bronchodilator. Is that what the red Yeah, that, the little red one. So yeah, the little red one's albuterol, and it's just a bronchodilator. So what's the purple one? The, the disc? Uh -huh. Those are corticosteroids. Oh, okay. But they're still just like long-term? Um, no, so yeah, you use those, like like you're talking about the one that's like brown yeah. like this. You use that long-term, like that's okay. not a short-term fix. Okay. Whether it's the, the purple one or the blue one or whatever. So like you those. can use corticosteroids short-term for your asthma. Right, but it's not fast at all. So when you want fast, like you need to bind to those yeah. beta-2 receptors and make that dilate instantly. I feel like more, I feel like it's I had one when I was little, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I grew out of it or something. Sometimes you, you do. do. But yeah. like, I felt like it was just mental for me, so I, like, I just stopped using it. Sometimes you just kind of grow out of it um, uh, when you make those adjustments. Um, I mean, if it was severe, like you use an epi too. What's so. the difference in asthma and restrictive airway? Right, restrictive or right? Like COPD. No, like just. Or is it restrictive airway? It, this airway? is restriction. Like this is okay. a restriction of the airway. Okay. 
So it's just the same thing. Okay, more on this later too, as we talk about this. We'll get into the, some details here. But um, like asthma, we think about this kind of like mild, like to do with the inhaler. Severe asthma will kill you. Like we have lots of asthma-related deaths where people have these asthma attacks, and, and either the the emergency inhaler is not very effective because they become adjusted to it, or they don't have access to it. But yeah, there there are always asthma-related deaths. Tuberculosis is not obstructive. Tuberculosis is restrictive. Restrictive, when we say that we have a restricted pulmonary disease as opposed to an obstructive pulmonary disease, restricted means the lungs don't want to inflate. We increase, or we, we decrease compliance. They make it more difficult for them to inflate. Tuberculosis causes scar tissue to build up the lungs. It's hard for them to inflate. And this bacteria is damaging the inside of the lungs. Tuberculosis used to be called consumption because your patient is coughing so hard that they're using all their energy coughing and it's difficult to eat when you're coughing so freaking hard. Um, like they'll cough until they vomit and they'll cough up blood. Sweating at night because like in the coughing. Um, and this used to be like, like if you had tuberculosis, you were gonna die. Um, and you see like any like Western movie where they're coughing up blood, tuberculosis, it was pretty common. It's freaking contagious and everything. Um, treatment today, antibiotics. Like about a year. Oh yeah, it's hella contagious. Like if you get the blood on you or what? Like, what? Like, like stress? But no, it takes a long time to show up. If you get it. How do you get it? From somebody like coughing. Like like just coughing on you? Yeah. I just did in class with tuberculosis once. Um, you had tuberculosis? No, no. no and I was super surprised because she was in class and she was coughing up her lungs. And um, I was like, wow, tuberculosis sucks. I was just being a smart ass. I didn't know she actually had tuberculosis. <laughs> so, like, the next day I got an email. I was email. not spreading it, though. Um, she was. So, uh, the next day I got an email from the dean of students. It's like, a student in your class has active tuberculosis. She's been withdrawn from class. Everybody in class had to go get tested for TB. Wow. If you work, so like, you gotta get your test. You get your test. So yep. when you get your test, nothing's come up. So they, so they stick you, and they're injecting you with um, something. And if you've ever been exposed to tuberculosis, your immune system's like, oh hell no. And then you get inflammation there, and, and like these little welts swell up there because it thinks that that's tuberculosis. We gotta stop that crap. If you've never been exposed to tuberculosis, nothing. Nothing's gonna come up. Nothing's gonna come up. Um, the good news is that if you ever have been exposed to tuberculosis, you never have to get another TB test because you'll always test positive. Do you get like the bad news is you've got to get chest X-rays. Oh, that's what happened. So if you test positive for tuberculosis, they can do a chest X-ray and they can see if you have active tuberculosis. So we'll look at what that looks like on an X-ray. Like if you see that's that crazy. that massive lung, you're like, oh crap, you've got active tuberculosis, and then you have to get a 12 month treatment. So if you get tested. Then you, you get to where you want. No. It shows often. Or no, if you get tested, like, they'll test, working in the hospital, they're going to test you, like, it's probably once a year. Yeah, every 12 months. Um, even when I worked in the gross lab, the med school, I had to get tested for tuberculosis once a year, which is stupid because all my patients were already dead. Like, I'm like, <laughs> why do they care? And they're like, you care. And I'm like, do I? Do I? Um, I'm like, because I hate it. I was like, that's. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's different. But, yeah. It, I, if you ever, like I said, if you ever test positive, the, the good news is you don't ever have to have it again. But the bad news is they can do a chest x-ray once a year to make sure that you don't have active tuberculosis because it does spread like crazy when it spreads. And it's like hospitals are sort of the place where stuff spreads. So yeah, um, as a healthcare worker, you get tested for TB a lot. So she got withdrawal from class because she had to have treat like... Mm -hmm. she, yeah. Well, she was that sick, really. Okay. So like, she took an incomplete and had to come back because she was that sick. Damn, she she just didn't know she was that sick. She thought she had the flu. Damn. Which still, I mean, that's why you came to class with the flu. I kind of hate you anyway. Um, I'm like, so you're like, it's the flu. I'm going to still your, your class with that. It's going to be yeah. fine. Everybody's it's got the flu, fine. right? Bad call on her part. But um, yeah, tuberculosis was a lot more serious. And so that has to be like, she was much sicker than she thought she had to be. Like, that was 
like the administration was like, oh, you're super sick, so the administration just took me to the online classes and came back and finished with Um The other pathophys that we'll talk about um, next week is lung cancer. Um, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in North America. Um, and the vast majority of lung cancer cases are smoking. Now, that's not always the case. I, just personally, like I've got a couple of people that have lung cancer that have never smoked. Um, so why, it's, you know, sometimes it's just one of those things where you're exposed to some sort of carcinogen, you may not have even known it, and the genetics are there, and it sets this, uh, like one of those oncogenes off, and, and then you've got blood cancer. So um, sometimes it happens and there's really, it's hard to pinpoint. Um, other times, like you see like environmental exposure to different carcinogens, like, yeah, I don't smoke, like, yeah, you also like, you know, constantly breathe in smoke, so I mean, you might as well. Uh, there are different types of lung cancer, and we'll look at pictures here too. There's squamous cell carcinoma, that's the ep actual epithelial tissue of the, the, uh, the uh, bronchi. There's uh, adenocarcinoma, which is sort of on the periphery of the lungs. And then small cell carcinoma, which are these little lymphocyte lymph -like cells that are really tiny um, that metastasize like crazy. Other tumors will often metastasize to the lung. One of our cadavers on the table died of lymphoma and it metastasized to his lungs and his lungs are mostly lymphoma cancer tissue. <laughs> so more on that and pictures of that later. Um, <clears throat> but our big causative factor here really is smoking. So much so that um, for a while, and in some countries they do this, um, they were, and it's still this is always this always comes up. The idea of printing like autopsy pictures on packages of cigarettes. Oh, here's what your lungs look like when you're dead. Now you don't want to buy cigarettes, and I was like, actually, now I kind of want to collect the set. It's like I did want to buy cigarettes before, but now I need like I need emphysema because I'm okay. I don't have an emphysema, but I'll trade you like a small cell carcinoma for emphysema, like. It's a set now, and I need to collect them all. And uh, so that would sort of the opposite. But other countries will do this, and I'll put those like really gross lung pictures on there. I don't know if it helps or not. We're not going to worry about development. So there it is, coming off the gut tube. And it's not, we're not going to worry about this. Um, by about 20 weeks in, 28 weeks in, hypothetically, a premium could bring on their own. We do have to worry about surfactant and inventory risk. Infantor, infant respiratory distress syndrome. Um, but <coughs> as soon as you're born and they cut that cord, carbon dioxide builds up, respiratory center fires, you breathe. Uh, babies breathe really fast, and that sticks around for a little while, and then it kind of normalizes um, <coughs> age. Um, your lungs are still forming in your late teens. But they're still growing. And so this is another danger that we see, like when we think about like kids smoking, is it, it doesn't just damage their lungs in an early, you don't just start sooner, you're also disrupting development because they're not quite done yet. And so it makes things worse, but the sooner you start, the worse this looks um, in terms of your long-term prognosis. Um, as we look at these different respiratory diseases, next time we talk about COPD, um, one of the things we'll look at is how it influences the pH of the blood. And then we'll talk about how the kidneys <coughs> deal with the pH of the blood and how those two ideas are going together. So you'll notice in this section, it's like renal, respiratory, and acid base. Because those three ideas are really closely combined together. Like um, renal function and respiratory function are how we manage the pH of your blood. So uh, we'll talk about that later. As you get older, like everything, um, efficiency sort of goes down with respiration. All right. So on Tuesday, we're going to come back and talk about pathophysiology with the respiratory system. And we'll look at that um, on Thursday, and then we'll